I greet you again in the name of Jesus. And this is um, hopefully why we're here is to, I trust we're all here to uphold the ways of Christ and to walk in his ways and and um, appreciate all the different things we've We've heard this morning, I've been taught, and different thoughts. Um, if you want to stand for prayer, we'll have prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your greatness and your goodness. We thank you for considering us in, and that your thoughts are for us and that we might that we can even serve you and that your thoughts are for our good. We thank you. We ask that you would be with each one of us today and forever. Help us to apply these things we've heard and don't allow us to go to the grave with unforgiveness and with pride or covetousness and greediness. Just speak to us. Thank you <clears throat> most of all for for Christ and his, his willingness to come and teach us, his willingness to forgive us, his willingness for everything he's done for us. Many unknown things that we don't know, and we, we just thank you for it. Pray this in his name. seems like the most important thing in, in our life here is to uh, to have a trust in our creator in our maker and uh, I guess I always wonder what makes us trust him uh, I'm not even sure I fully understand how God operates how he, how he comes to us in, in such a way that we can be, um, so that we can trust him and safely trust in him. There's this, this thing going across the world at this time called um, coronavirus, and people are all concerned about it. They're worried about it, and, um, and it's killing people. But we understand it's not that it's not dangerous. But does it matter to us? Are we prepared to die? This is uh, this is this is important because. If we're unprepared to die, I don't think our end can be very good. So, so we got this this time today. We sh we're still with the living, each one of us. But whether whether a virus kills us or whether something else kills us, we're we're going to have to die, and it's just a matter of time. So what is our trust in God? Do we do we really do we really relax in his goodness and his and in and that we 
How deep is our trust in him? And uh, I guess tied with that is, I think tied with that is how we trust each other. Um, There's some mention made, I forget exactly what was said, but my thought went to the, to the, um, um, Uh, it worse than I slipped my mind, so I'll leave it for later. So it's important for us to um, I think to consider what we trust in. We know that a lot of people trust in the might of of um, military. In the, in the Old Testament, David was so curious. I guess I still don't quite. Maybe some brothers know better than I do, but uh, he was so curious how strong he was that he counted the men and and Joab whatever. Uh, whatever this terrible sin was, Joab said, well, we got God. We don't need to count. I guess it's maybe it's that symbol. We don't need to know. And he seemed to realize it's a bad thing. But the king's words prevailed against him. And so he carried out what the king told him to do. He went out and counted the people. And I can't remember if that's the time that God started slaughtering people or they were just dying. And um, so, we, so our trust needs to be in the eternal because that's where we're headed. We need to have a vision beyond this time. And, uh, and how we respond to these things on earth can tell us where our trust is, what we, what we, where we, what we long for. And uh, and for a verse for that, I was thinking about Romans four, uh, one to eight. I just noticed this morning before I came talks about a work that is righteous without works. And and Buddy was teaching us about if we don't have works, if we don't do um, these things. And this doesn't conflict with that at all. Um, Well, I'll just read it now. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and is reckoned to him as righteousness. Now no one who works wages are not to one who works wages are not reckoned as a gift. I'm still not reading that right. Now to the one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as someone, as something due. But to the one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. So also David speaks of the blessedness of those to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one against whom the Lord will not reckon sin. We've heard a lot of that this morning about reconciling to our God. Um, And so blessed are those that our iniquities not held against us. And also the strong warning that if if we don't forgive our neighbor, if we start holding our neighbor to something we become in grave danger of, if not maybe an absolute danger, of having that put back in our head, what God has forgiven us. 
if we're not able to forgive others. And uh, we, we just need to, I just need to take that very seriously. We all need to. And uh, another thought I had was, uh, I was reminded of, of, it's kind of interlinked with forgiveness. Um, maybe it's, like if somebody does something to us, and uh, it hurts us, and puts us down, and in talks bad about us. And maybe he's doing it in ignorance even. Maybe he doesn't even realize what he's doing. I hope we're not that way. I hope not we're the one that offends people because woe to the one that offends has to come through. So we don't, we don't want to be of those. But if somebody does offend us, are we... Are we willing and able to forgive and and continue in uh, in in cleanness before God? Because when we start holding on to stuff, the reality is going to come out. We we can't hide. I I think we have a hard time at least hiding unforgiveness from anybody. We might hide it. We might hide the specific thing, but if there's unforgiveness in our hearts, I think we will be destroyed one way or another. Um, it'll it'll come out in other other in other parts of our life. It's just going to do us great harm. And and the thing is. There's a chance that other person doesn't even know. We we imagine, we imagine things quite often and uh, end up just hanging on to something instead of just forgiving and allowing it to go. We 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 ruin ourselves with. I'm not sure how to describe it. We just ruin ourselves by something that is not all that difficult to to do. If if we love God, if we again, we can't really separate uh, loving God and and forgiving others. We're not. We can't claim that we we love God and and don't forgive the ones around us. This is an impossibility. I don't know which. It's in the, in the scripture somewhere of, of that. I'm not sure where it's at. But, um, and so, again, I was thinking of the reason I read this Romans 4 is, okay, we're in this life right now, and the time is coming when we're not going to be here. So if we... If we can trust God far enough, actually the requirement is we to trust God with our, own, our whole heart, our whole mind, our soul, and our strength, everything that is in us, even giving our lives, even giving our wives and giving our children, and giving our parents, giving everybody up. That's the requirement. If we cling to anything other than... Um, other than God, I, that's what we're going to have. So we need to be careful what we're clinging to. That doesn't mean we're not respectful to parents. It doesn't mean we're not respectful to, to our partners, and, uh, to our children, and, and even that we respect our life. But there has to be a separation. So if we if we can trust beyond so so this this virus that can kill 
which is many other ways that we can be killed too. There's, it's not, it's not even all that. I, I'm not sure how to say this, but it's not all that serious a plague as as has been in the past. Um, statistically, maybe two to three percent. I don't know how accurate that is, but it's. That's what they're saying. Which means maybe one or two of us here. Um, I, I don't know how to say this. It's sounding like I don't care. It's not that I don't care. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is, is our trust. So, okay. So we can be killed anytime. We some of us may not make it home tonight. There's been, um, we know of, of that one family that was, I mentioned it not too long ago, I think, but uh, they were going down the road and the semi crossed across the medium and hit them head on and, and many died. Uh, another family I know, they went to bed, he sat in each other's arms with his wife and um, the next morning, five of his children were dead, half of them were dead, and his wife was gone. There was a fire broke out and, and got half of his family. Um, this is just to show that we don't have a, a continuing city here. So coronavirus is not um, the only thing that we need to, um, that can end our life here on earth. But do we trust beyond is the question. If we, want, if we want works that are righteous, that are no works in our part, it's to trust God. And it can be given to us. But to the one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. If we've forsaken all in our life now, I know some people have reckoned it to a, like a, a dead dog. Does it, does it hurt if something happens? Does it, does it matter if you kick it? Does it get angry? Does it, does, it's dead. And that's, that's an illustration that if we're still, still alive, we can be agitated, we can be angered, we can um, not control our eyes, we lost, and... and um, all these different ways that we get honor, power. There's, there's just so many things that we can um, get into. So, um, I was thinking that there's something we often, I've often, I don't know, I guess I've often spoke about, and I think we've often heard of the different, um, like looking back. It's not, if we look back, put our hand on the plow and look back, we're not fit for the kingdom of God. I was thinking <clears throat> that. We all have different experiences in our life that caused us to trust God. And I would imagine all of us would have something, something or another that we, we remember how God rescued us or how we submitted to God or how... Um, whatever happened that we, we trust God. I, I don't think we'll repent unless we trust something greater than that. If we don't trust God, we won't repent. I, I guess, I'm not sure, but I, I think. So the, the key thing is that I, God has to get us to trust Him before we're going to be impressed with 
serving him, before we're willing to lay down our life completely for him. We have to trust him. And this is something that Abraham did when he was, when he was told to go into another land. We could say, we're told we're going to go to another land too. But when Abraham was told he's going to another land, he just packed up and went. He didn't know where. God didn't tell him. He said, oh, this is going to be your place. This is going to be where everybody's going to be. Of his, um, of his descendants. And, uh, and he didn't have any children. Those patriarchs, some of them were severely tested. And um, we need to be tested too. I, I'll leave that in God's hands, but it, we need those testings too. But they went through, if we think that's a, such an easy thing, just pack up and leave, not knowing where we're going, it, it's not so easy. But God told us we've got to pack up and go one of these days. So are we trusting him? And uh, I was just thinking through my life of, um, and I'm, one of the, I, I, I'm sure we all have many times in our life when we've, we've uh, met up or have had special encounters with God. I'm not sure how to say that, but um, It would be kind of my, the first time I really think that I surrendered myself to God. And it would have been, oh, well, we weren't married too long. And there's this, there's a new group uh, in Cookville, Tennessee that supposedly would have been doing better than we were doing there where I lived. And um, so how do you decide? How do you know what to do? Where do you go? And uh, so that was one of my marks of, of just submitting to God and, and allowing him to, and just telling him that I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I didn't know what it was. I may still not know all that it, there is, but um, and it seems like it's a stepping stone in my life of, and, and of observing what God did after that I, I think God recognized that that um, surrender to him and he started a process that I don't always understand how he does things but he uh, He's brought me here, and I, I guess I'm thankful for being here with all of you and um, what the future holds. I still don't know. Are we? It's just like this uh, coronavirus. Uh, it's just in a lot of people's minds. and I don't think it needs to be in our minds a whole lot. I'm not advocating that we start thinking about this. Um, we can make wise choices, whatever we have need of at the time. And I think we can do that when persecution comes, when persecution comes. People are worried about persecution. I'm not sure why I don't want to worry about it anymore either. But I, did, I used to be concerned about that and how to be prepared and how to do this and how to do, how to do that. And escape plans. And, but it's not, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I think God is able to take care of us day by day and in uh, so I don't know. Um, Robert, if you had the mic, would you be able to share one story that you have that you trust in that cause you to trust in God or you have one more mile marker that you would be willing to share 
Robert Kane? Yeah. <laughs> He's not behind you. Well, somewhere maybe. He was outside. Uh, yeah, some kind of a thing that is, you're... Uh, okay, so uh, let me finish this first. So I was thinking that we need to... This is something we can bring up to each other all the time, anytime, is things that have drawn us closer to God and have, uh, have made a step toward God. And I think Satan's going to be... It's going to burn his ears. He's, he's, he won't really appreciate if we bring up our testimonies, bring up things that have blessed us or things that we can look back this way and bring it up. Satan's not happy when we bring this up, I don't think. And God is going to be pleased. That's what, that was my thought. When, uh, when the God of my life was myself, and of course everyone struggles with that, who wants to be God, is it ourselves or God himself and, and when I used to run all day in my from 18 to 28 where I could run uh, all the time beautiful weather out in Arizona where it's just visibility unlimited and just run all the day and ah, all of this and uh, this is great and then when my knees went bad brother I, my knees went bad and I, I, I just walk a, a quarter of a mile I had to be in pain I didn't even have puppies in my shoes then I I can walk barefoot and everything, and wow, I'm saying, well, uh, what's there to live for now? I said, well, I'm going to die as a cripple and 28 years old, but uh, then I started studying the Bible, because I, as I grew up as a worldly Catholic, you know, it was, uh, <clears throat> ah, Red Sox, you know, that's, that, that was my God, Red Sox, patriots, sports, foolishness, us, myself, that was, you know, I didn't have time for, for anything else, um, but... Then, like Psalmist said in Psalm 119, it was good that I was afflicted because I learned thy testimonies. And so I went to a Pentecostal meeting. I remember R.W. Schambach, one of these kind of health and prosperity gospels, and, you know, just, you will believe when you get healed and you have your hands laid on. You'll get your legs back and, and you know, all the crutches and wheelchairs and all the canes that were, you know, discarded. And I went there and laid my, it was in Phoenix, and I had a, a young black guy go with me. And uh, we, we went there, and uh, you know, we thought this is great. And uh, but I got hands laid on me. And my knees were just a little bit sore after that than it was before. But when I went home, you know, I started studying the scriptures and and doing that. And I, I finally came to the realization that even if I don't get well, reading the gospel, reading the words of Jesus, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And not Romans and Ephesians and, and the other books, Joel. They're, they're written to Christians. Just the basics helped me. That's Brother Joel wrote a tract, the Gospel of Matthew with the Roman Road. That helped me to understand. And it's been a long road to like Cookville. And I'm, and I'm thrilled to be here. But that, that, that was the first step to find out that it's not about me. It's about him. And I'm less than nothing. And I thank the Lord for you, brethren. I would... Uh... Anybody else would like to share something? Tail? Yeah, when you said, uh, does anybody have a testimony? My heart just started beating because I was thinking of all the times, all the things I could share, um, but I'm not really the best public speaker, so I kind of get nervous. But anyways, um, a lot of my testimonies are from when I was traveling around. This is a testimony that I really, it just really blessed me. It's, it's one of those times when you're like, does God even love me? And then, like, the heavens open up, and just, it, just a flood of blessings come down. But anyways, um, I was traveling from, uh, where was it, Ann Arbor, Michigan, to Palo Alto, California, and I was going to go try to find housing for the brothers, maybe go out and try to find a work exchange, a work trade, so we could um, be on the West Coast. And um, along the way, no, sorry, I started out in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then I went to Ann Arbor. But I was, I was on my bike, I was by myself, and when I got close to Ann Arbor, Michigan, I, I, what we would do, we'd, we'd make phone calls, you know, and keep in contact that way. Not, the pay, not cell phones, we had pay phones, so... I called in to just check in, let 
brothers know that I was okay and everything was fine. And, and one of the brothers said, um, would you like to uh, fellowship this weekend and go visit uh, one of the camps? You know, there's a camp near there in Ann Arbor. And I was like, yeah, what a blessing. You know, like, of course. And so, but in my mind, I had this mission. I was heading to the West Coast. But I'll, I'll stop, I'll fellowship, get refreshed, maybe get some more supplies and whatnot. And um, so I stayed there in Ann Arbor, and one day turned into three days. You know, I thought I was just going to be there for the weekend. One day turned into three days. Three days turned into a week. A week turned into two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months, three months. And I started to really get anxious and tried because... I was on a mission to go find housing for the brothers, and I was really excited about it. It was a service I could do. And here I am in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm like, this is not part of the vision. Like, this is not what I was setting out to do. And an older brother, he looked at me. He, he could kind of tell, you know, and he said, um, he said, brother, I think, I think you're just discontent. Like, you're setting your heart on this thing, and you're, and you're not accepting where you're at, like right now, you're not content. You're just, you're, that's really what your struggle is. And, and um, he was so right, but I just couldn't see it at the time. Anyways, I, I think a few days passed or a month, I, I'm not sure the time frame there, but I had a dream and I was on the road fidgeting with a light on my bicycle. And so I thought, this is it. This is the, you know, the Lord showing me, I got to go. And uh, I told the brothers that and they were like, okay, all right. But I wonder if they were just, you know, more so thinking, um, I probably should have stayed, but they were letting me go. So anyways, I'll try to make it fast. I, I set out from Ann Arbor. I got all the way to the last exit in Colorado. It was this beautiful day. It was a perfect sunset in Colorado. I thought I could just pitch my tent right here and just call it a day. But I said, I'll just, I'll just maybe just stay a little bit longer. And I prayed, Lord, you know, for if I got a ride in this amount of time, then I'll take the ride. If not, I'll just stay. And this RV, brand new RV, passed me, and uh, he looked at me, and I was kind of counting down, like ten, nine, eight, you know, to just go and pitch my tent. And he turned around, and I ran out of time, and I probably should have just went and pitched my tent. But he turned around, and he came back, and he said, "Where are you going?" I said, "I'm going to Palo Alto." He said, "Well, I'm going to San Francisco." And if you give me some gas money, I'll, I'll take you there. I'll help you get your ride there. And I thought, okay, I'll give you 20 bucks. And um, he's like, no, I need 40. I was like, okay. You know, I thought that's, that's a pretty good deal, $40 to get all the way from, to San Francisco from Colorado. So I gave him $40. And um, there's a lot more detail to this, but I'm just trying to hurry it along here. So I get in the ride with him. And I'm starting to wonder how sound he is, you know, he, was doing some things that were really making me question and um I thought it was probably better just to be quiet and not get into a whole lot of words with them and um so I took I fell asleep and I woke up it was probably around the middle of the night and we were parked on the side of the road and he said I think one of the tail lights is out and it, this is kind of an old trick that kids do to each other when you're growing up but I'm not sure if you all know about it but he said uh I think one of the, the tail lights is out. Would you, would you mind to go check? And I thought, oh no. You know, like, what am I going to do? Like, if I take all my stuff, he's surely going to leave me out here. If I trust him and he leaves me out here, he's going to take all my stuff, which wasn't very much. But um, it was, it was a kind of this really unsure moment. And I said, you're not going to leave me out here, are you? And he said, no, I'm not going to leave you out here. Now, this was in the middle of the Utah basin, out in, the, in the, like the desert, middle of the night. No lights. It was dark, no moon. And I was like, I, I didn't really have much of a choice. I, okay, so I went out. He said, it's the left one. And then he hit the gas, and he drove away. And he left me in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the night, and I had nothing. And I have to tell you, that was probably one of the scariest times of my life because um, I could hear coyotes all around me. I wa actually watched him drive away. He, he drove for nine miles because I counted for nine minutes. 
and I figured 60 miles, 60 minutes, a mile a minute. So I counted for it. I could watch him for nine miles or nine minutes. And then it was just nothing. It was me out in the middle of the And um, I could hear the coyotes all around me. And I was like, coyotes? Like, I know they're small, but what if there was like 15 of them? Like, what would they do? Would they pack up? And uh, so I was, I was scared. And then I was thinking, what about snakes? Like rattlesnakes, you know? Like they what, probably in the heat of the day, they come out to the road and they just nestle on the side of the road and get warm. You know, now it's dark and they're still there because the concrete's still hot. So I was having all these like, I mean, I was really getting tried. My faith was getting tried. Everything was getting tried. And I, I got down in the middle of the, of the street and I raised my hands and I prayed, God, I just pray that you would keep me and I pray that you'd walk. I used send an angel to walk on my right and an angel to walk on my left side and just keep me safe, Lord. And that gave me a lot of comfort. But at the same time, now I was more afraid that there was a, a real angel walking on the right side and the left side, like this dread of, you know, just praying in desperation, like really being of faith, and then just like, just be believing that he's, he's keeping me there. And um, anyways, a number of cars had passed me. I, imagine you're just out in the middle of nowhere, you got no stuff, and this guy wants a ride. You know, people just probably thought I was crazy. And um, one time this car stopped, and it looked at me for about like 45 seconds, and then it sped off. And nobody was going to stop for me. They, you know, I don't blame them. I probably would, I would really question if I would stop for somebody in that situation. Um, hopefully I'd do the right thing, but I could see, I could, it's understandable that they were concerned. Um, so I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking. I've been walking for hours. And then off in the distance, I could kind of see these lights, red and yellow, or red and blue, red and blue. But at the same time, you know how when you look at a star, it'll do that red, blue light. So I wasn't sure if, like, what was going on, if my eyes were just seeing something or I thought I was really seeing the red and blue lights. Anyways, it got closer and closer, and it was a police officer. He finally came all the way out there. He put his big beam on me. He said, stay right there. Um, I just want to check your ID. I told him my story. I was almost crying. I was so broken. And I was probably crying when I was telling him. And um, he said, just stay right there. I want to run your name. Just make sure you know everything's okay. So if you don't have any warrants and everything's okay, I'll take you into town. So he ran my name, of course, no warrants, no nothing. So he takes me into, camp, into town. He was really nice to me. He said, if you want to just sleep in the park tonight, that's fine. And then tomorrow, um, I'll let you hitch out of town. I won't give you any trouble. And this was, in, um, this was on Highway 50, and National Geographic did an article about it. It was called The Loneliest Road in America. So it was Highway 50 and 6 where they split. And um, so I sat there all day hitching for a ride. Nobody. One time a kid picked me up and he took me. You know, I, I just took the ride. I was so excited. He was like, yeah. And uh, I said, where are you going? He said, oh, I'm just going down the street here to the golf course. I work there. So he took me all, he took me like half a mile into the desert. And then there's nothing there except for a golf course. So I had to actually walk back. And then I, I walked back and um, I was there. I was really discouraged. All I had was just the clothes on my back in my New Testament. And um, this guy pulls into this, into this parking lot, and, I thought, and he kind of looked at me like, he gave me like, a, like a, a look of hope. Like, and I thought, what if I just go ask him, you know, if he could help me? So he pulled in, so I walk, I walk to the parking lot, and it's a church. And he's not there, and so I just figured he probably went inside. So I go inside, and it's a congregation of about... Um, Let's see, there's a pastor, his son, an elderly man, and maybe an elderly woman, and me. And I come in and I say, I just tell him what happened. I say, I just, I just need a ride to the interstate. Is anybody willing to help me? And he said, well, we'll see what we can do if you want to stay for the service. And, uh, and afterwards, we'll see about helping you. And I was like, okay, great. Like, you know, that sounds like a blessing. He said, we've been studying the book of Hebrews and uh, today we're on the 13th chapter. And um, so if you just stay with us for the study and then afterwards, you know, we'll see if we can help you. So I was, I was just so thankful. And this is where I, I just really saw God. Like, he's, he's coming to help me and deliver me. And he, he opens up 
And he starts reading, and I think it starts out, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for some have entertained angels unawares. Now imagine this little congregation, and this man comes in and says, I need help, this stranger. And this is the verse that they're, they're reading. And it's the 13th week. That, you know, it's, it was really amazing to me. I just thought, oh, this is it. Like, these people are going to help me. What a blessing. And then, but really what stood out to me is it goes down and it says, uh, be content with such, such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And that is the reason why I think it all happened because I was struggling with contentment. And so God just put me through this situation, this fire to teach me how to be content. Um, it was interesting too, the pastor, he, he was really, you know, he took the time to make sure like, you know, just to reassure the crowd, maybe I'm not an angel, you know, which I agree. I didn't think I was an angel there. But anyways, those people, they, they were super hospitable to, me, hospitable to me. They took me to the highway. They took me out to dinner and they bought me a hotel room. And uh, they just, it just really comforted me and it just really gave me, you know, like, like when, when, when we need God, if we cry out to him with all of our heart, he's there to deliver us. He, he is faithful. So. Thank you. Is there some, <clears throat> somebody else? In the, in the way you had to be tested, uh, God had to bring you into that situation. So, but again, woe to the one who brings that offense. It's, if God has to use us to do bad, that is not, not a good place to be in. Well, there's nobody else that has a malmarker they'd like to. I had something happen a few years ago that I think I've told, I know I've told some of you about. It's still a kind of mysterious thing to me, but I, I guess I take it as, as a confirmation that, that uh, God is there. Uh, it was maybe three or four years ago. Uh, Michael had been staying, Michael Ostringer had been staying with us up in Hazleton. And I think I was, we, we were driving down to Vancouver. I think maybe he was going to fly somewhere. Either he was going back home or he was flying out here. I, I don't remember exactly, but we, we were driving together uh, in my car. And uh, it was sometime in the winter, I think. And um, we, were, we were taking turns driving through the night, and uh, um, we uh, we were we were still a few hours from where our next stop was going to be, which was where uh, Tyler, Tyler and Katrina were staying at the time in Surrey, and uh, we um, Michael was driving and I was sleeping, and it was just just after sunrise, and. Uh, we had no no trouble on the trip, and um, and I, I was I was sleeping, and I had this dream uh, that that all of a sudden I had this dream that we that we went off the road in the car. Uh, it was Michael and Paul and I were were driving together, and uh, and in my dream I we, we the car went off the road into the ditch and. Um, and we got out of the car, and everyone was okay. And I, and I said something like, "Praise God, no one was hurt." And just as I woke up from that dream, we were going around a corner, and there was—I guess we didn't realize at the time—but there was ice on the road, just a little bit, and the sun was just hitting on it. We were coming down a hill where the sun was was shining on the hill, and it was just starting to melt the ice. And so there was this—it was pretty slick, and we were going around a kind of slow corner and as we were going around a corner this bowl that was on the dash started to started to move across the you know tried to roll and, and Michael just reached up to grab it before it before it fell and we'd started doing doing donuts on the 
on the in the middle of the highway, and uh, I don't know. We went around three or four or five times, something like that, and then ended up off the side into the ditch. And um, and we it, just like my dream, we got out of the car, and everyone was okay. We thank God that <laughs> that we were we were all safe and and uh, there's just a couple things that really stuck out to me um, about that uh, incident. One one was just this weird experience of having this dream. Like I don't, you know how it is when you're waking up from sleep. I don't know if this was seconds before or minutes before or what, but like almost immediately before this happened, having a dream like that. Why? What's the purpose of that? I don't know, other than maybe just for God to say I, like, I'm in control of the situation. The other thing that stood out to me is, so we went into this ditch. It was kind of a shallow ditch, and there was some snow in there, and there was a huge, not huge, but a big rock, like maybe the size of a, I don't know, this sort of size rock that we just, just went by. You know, it, it, was, a, it was a big enough rock that if we'd gone over it, we would have been getting another vehicle pretty sure uh, but we went just just to the side of it and uh, we were able after a few minutes of uh, to actually just to push the vehicle out of the ditch it wasn't a really deep ditch and, and just kept on going and there was nothing wrong with the car and uh, and it reminded me as I thought about that how we just missed that that rock it just reminded me that verse that that Satan actually quotes to to Jesus when he's tempting him to to go jump off the off the temple roof that he will send his angels to guard you and your foot will not strike a rock. And I, did, I mean, it, I, it just, it just stuck in my mind that just this really strange, ins, you know, what was the purpose of it? I don't know, other than maybe just to, to draw my mind to the fact that there's a lot going on in the spiritual realm that we don't see and, and, you know, in, in, in the eyes of the flesh, all it was is, we slipped on some ice and went in the road and everything was fine, but it just, I guess, I guess to me it's a testimony that God, God is there um, to protect us. And uh, it's the only explanation that I have uh, of that strange incident, just that that was what he was trying to communicate. God does those things. He, he, um, gives us what we have need of. Anyways, I would just encourage us all to um, exercise in this area of bringing up things that I guess we're doing it all the time, but just just uh, just seems like it would be a, a help to us and an encouragement and a, there's a trust um, also in um, self trust that is not so good um, <clears throat> In Luke 18, 10, it says, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The way I understand, uh, the Pharisee would have been this godly, upright, good person that was thought himself of himself quite well. He thought himself very godly, and he thought himself as the it. And we understand the tax collector is one of those that were accused of cheating and stealing and and uh, charging more for taxes or whatever the case may be. And verse 11 says, The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, thieves, rubes, adulterers, even like this tax collector, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tenth a tenth of all my income. 
the tax collector standing off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his home just to justify it rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. So when we humble ourselves, God can exalt us. If we exalt ourselves, God will humble us. And um, I don't know if it's fair to say that that's humiliation, to be humble. I want to say how much I appreciate being here. Thank God that we can um, continue walking in the truth and, and praying that we can be humble, forgiving, helpful. We need all the things. Open it up for comment. Thank you, Brother Walter. It's been a blessing to be here for me this morning. And uh, I just appreciate the the reminder that that we put our trust in God and not those other things. It was really edifying to hear those testimonies. Robert Teo and Joel and made me think of my own experiences that just help you remember anew that uh, that our hope is in God and uh, it's timely. I don't know how others feel, but I just I think I've I've had my full already of reading and hearing about COVID nineteen or the coronavirus, and yet I think. We're going to be filled overflowing with that, so I'm just I'm just thankful for the very timely reminder of um, of where our trust is. Amen. Amen. This one's not about me. This is I nudged my wife, but it's it's a bull story, but it's not bull. Okay, it's uh, my wife when she was uh, a young virgin. Uh, she was, she liked to, she grew up on a f farm in Shenandoah Valley, milking cows, and and uh, one day she was working for these uh, hired men that had a, uh, a bull, and she was trying to get the bull in with the cow to mate, and the bull didn't want to do that, and so the bull knocked her down, and she got up, the bull would knock her down again, she got up, Bull will knock her down again. She got up and she was saying, Lord, this is a terrible way for me to die. So she screamed, help, help. And there was a hired man. Oh, I don't know, maybe by Joe's bus or further. I don't know how far. But he picked up a rock. And she says this, that he just one shot hit the bull right in the nose, which gave her a time to escape and, and uh, save her life. And so she... she uh, she said, well, you can tell a story if you want, but <laughs> that was, uh, you know, it was like David in the slingshot, I guess. It just it got the right thing. And uh, the Lord be magnified.
Thank you.